to uh, what we describe as a Q&A with Wally Haas. And Wally and I have been friends for almost 35 years. I've had the great pleasure of not only being a friend of Wally's, but I'll tell you a great story. And some of you may have experienced this with people you've worked. But to have um, someone, I worked with Wally for about 15 years at the Oakland A's. And if anyone has ever experienced having a boss, um, I get chills when I think about it, but I, I can recall the days that I would drive up to the Oakland Coliseum and hope, because he was such an incredible individual, humble, supportive, everything that you want in a boss, I would hope every day that I would see his car, that he would be there. And if you've experienced that, you only get that probably once in your lifetime. I'm certainly, I know the people in the Bread and Roses, they don't, when they drive up and see my car, they're not feeling that way. <laughs> and it kind of just sums up what the essence of uh, how I feel about Wally and what Wally means to me in my life. Um, Wally doesn't do this very often. Uh, I didn't have to twist his arm. I think um, his daughter, Simone, where's Simone? Simone here, who has been on our board for the last three years, is now a new member of our Circle Advisors who incidentally was in my first grade class when I was a teacher 100 years ago. Um, Simone said, how did Dave suck you into doing this tonight? And what was your response, Wally? David is my friend. <laughs> anyway, uh, to do a Q&A tonight, I want to introduce Paul Libertor and Wally Haas. Yeah, one, one last notion about Wally, I want to re remind you, you probably know him a, a bunch of different ways, the owner of a baseball team, philanthropist, but Paul will talk a little bit about his world, I mean, his experience in the, in the rock world. Some of you don't know about what he did many years ago in uh, the Bay Area music scene. So. I, I tried to keep that on the down. <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> I got you. Yeah, since this is a Bread and Roses event, yeah, I thought I we, okay. we would talk about music. Yeah, a little sure. bit anyway. You've done so many things. But we first met when you were the manager of the Sons of Champlin, which was um, yeah. Yeah. a great homegrown uh, Marin County, probably the original Marin County rock band, I think. Yeah. One of the first yeah. bands, very progressive, that had used horns and um, uh, sort of embodied the spirit of the 60s, a hippie band, let's put it that way. Very and that's so. and that's when Wally and I. Can you tell? And plus, you had been a musician before that too. Right. So uh, I thought it's an interesting story about how you started as a keyboard player. Well, yeah, Paul, that was a little unique. Um, I grew up in San Francisco. I took piano lessons. I went to a board, all boys boarding school. I didn't realize at the time that it was not only just an all boys boarding school, but it was an all boys boarding school that had mandatory Episcopalian chapel service eight times a week. I was one of three Jewish boys at the school, so it was kind of a rude awakening. And uh, as a freshman, you did all the, the worst of the jobs, and, and the headmaster said, well, if anyone who, would, who can play piano, you should try out because our organist is a senior and he'll be graduating, so you have all year to learn this instrument. So I raised my hand, and I guess no one else applied, so I got the job. That's the good news. The bad news is the guy got thrown out of school two weeks later. So the, the poor congregation of students and faculty played. It's got to sing the same two hymns for maybe six of the months while I tried to figure out this beautiful instrument. But it did give me a great love of the B3 organ. And um, I was fortunate enough to be a teenager in the 60s when the music scene was exploding in San Francisco. So every time I'd come home from school, I would pay my $3 to see Jimi Hendrix, The Who, you name it, Janis Joplin at Winterland or the Fillmore. Finally, one night my parents said, we're going with you. <laughs> and um, I had gone to the show the night before, and the first band was the John Mayall Blues Band featuring Eric Clapton on the guitar. <laughs> The other guy playing that night was a guy named Jimi Hendrix. Well, I thought, okay, we'll get him there early. And blah, blah. I, I'm digressing, but it's such a, a ahead, unique story. And I brought him there, and unfortunately, they changed the show around, and so my parents got to experience Jimi Hendrix, and they experienced him very differently. My father, after three minutes, said, okay, Ebby, we can go home now. And she says, no, Walter, I'm staying. Why don't you go and see if you can smell anyone smoking marijuana? Do something. Get out of here. Well, that was the last time they bothered me to, to see a rock band until one night when I was managing the Suns, who happened to be my very favorite band in the world, um, partly because of this great 
B3 organ sound of Bill Champlin's. Right. Um, we played the show, it was at Winterland, and he's coming off the stage and I see this flash going across me and it's my father. <laughs> and he came up and Bill Champlin's, I don't know if he could even see straight, but he's sweating bullets and he says, Bill, Walter Haas, nice to meet you. And I said, Dad, what are you doing? He says, I just paid five dollars to two thousand people here. Okay, and now I get it. So in his own way, he understood it. But I was, um, it was a very interesting time, for sure. And it must, it must have been a real challenge for you managing the sons. Of 